This video will be a guide to all core systems of planetary life at early access, so that includes creating star systems, configuring planets, as well as creating plant and animal life. When starting a new game, you can choose between a normal and unlimited game mode. In the normal game mode, you start with a set of tasks that will guide you in a tutorial-like fashion of what you should do, such as unlocking skills, configuring the planet, and creating life. This is useful to guide you in a bit of a direction, although it is a slower start. In the unlimited mode, on the other hand, you have the skill tree fully unlocked, and you have unlimited energy, so you can right away evolve animals to a very high complexity, although there is still a challenge of making sure they survive. For new beginners, I would suggest the normal mode with the Create Custom Star System. You can choose to have planets with water, you can choose to make the medium which is the recommended size, as well as sticking the balance check mark to make sure they are balanced planets. Once the star system is created, I recommend picking a planet that looks feasible for life. And here we're going to start with configuring the planet. In the Geosphere options, we have the core heat, if we put this all the way to the max, we will start seeing volcanoes arise. Now, yes, you do get plus 10 cosmic energy, which is useful as skill trees if you're playing in the normal mode, but high core heat is dangerous. The volcanoes, apart from killing everything in their area, they will start producing dust. As dust increases in the atmosphere, it starts blocking the sun from reaching your planet, kind of like clouds. So what it will do is that it will cool down your planet. So adding volcanoes, you start seeing the ice forming, for example. If we then revert the core heat to lower it to the lowest possible and we get this tool to remove the dust, you can right away see the ice melting because the temperature is going back to normal to what it was before. For a balanced planet, my recommendation is to not exceed the tree core heat value because that's where it starts becoming more dangerous. The option underneath it is the axial tilt. At 0%, we have something like the equator where it is naturally warmer. If we move this axial tilt all the way up, we start seeing that the temperature composition is modified. With 90% tilt, you'll see that the heat now is at the north and bottom pole. The way the tilt works is that it impacts where the sun hits your planet and which areas are closest to the sun. So you can play around the axial tilt, there is no right option, just figure out one that works for your planet. When it comes to atmospheric options, we're gonna start with the rainfall. If you decrease the rainfall area, you will see just at the equator, or you can increase it to be raining at the whole map. You can also change the rainfall rate, which has two impacts. First of all, if you have less rainfall, that means that the clouds will stay longer. On the second note, a higher rainfall rate makes sure that there is a higher water proportion on land compared to the air. Now going to the albedos above, these are color-coded well. So we have the cloud, depending on how much the clouds reflect sun. So at the red, they don't reflect much sun, so your planet will become super warm and it will start drying a lot of the water area. On the other hand, at the coldest option, the clouds will reflect a lot more light from the sun, making your planet cooler. Now, as you may see, even the coldest option can be correct for some of the planets. Same thing for the surface. You can put it all the way to max where it's creating more drought and warmer area, or you can go fully cold where it generally creates more snow and ice. So depending on a lot of factors, including the distance of the planet to the sun, the axial tilt, and all these albedo factors, your planet will change how it's structured. The last setting is the biosphere, where you can change the mutation rate for creatures and plants. So you might want to have a planet with low mutation and just evolve creatures manually, and another with high mutation, you want everything random. So it's up to you how to configure each planet. Now that we've explained the core options, let's look at the heat maps. So first we have something like the tectonic plates. So if we have a look at this yellow tectonic plate and look at the altitude, we can see that all of this section is elevated. It's pretty interesting how the tectonic plates will form where there are mountains, where there is water or valleys. Something that you may not realize is that it's the altitude that is impacting the weather. 
So for example, this high spot is super cold. So we can use tools like the earthquakes, lowering the land or smoothening terrain to smoothen this out and make the spot warmer than it was. In fact, reaching zero degrees and actually becoming water. There are a couple of other useful maps, including the air humidity and the moisture. Looking at this dry patch area, I can add the change humidity artifact and you can see that it is now no longer a desert. Having learned all the core principles, now I'm going to move to a rocket planet. So we're going to start from scratch. First things I'm doing is again, change the albedos a bit. Because we have no water right now, it's the surface albedo that I'm focusing on and the axial tilt. Once I'm overall pleased with this, we're going to create water by summoning comets. And by comets, I mean lots of comets. Once there is water in the planet, it is time to focus on adjusting the rainfall area and rate, adjusting the cloud albedo, and making sure we have a somewhat balanced planet. Once I reached almost 50% of water coverage, I was ready to start creating life. In my case, I wanted to start by showing off creating life from cells. Now here, I've learned a couple of tips. First, we we're gonna focus on a single cell and we're going to evolve the nucleus and then an additional component, preferably mitochondria if you want organismic diets or chloroplasts for photosynthetic diets. Once I have two components, I'd like to pause the game and kill all the other cells so that the cells that are reproduced have generally more than one component. From there, I like to evolve a two component cell with either a cell wall to go into plants or fungi or extracellular matrix if we want to create animals. From there, it becomes a much easier game of just evolving and attaching new cells. A key tip is to make sure you absorb some cells with additional molecules because that will increase the cell limit from 10 up to 15 and then 20. Once you have at least 10 cells within the multi-organism, you can evolve it into the macroscopic life form and that generates essentially either a plant, fungi or, in my case, a photosynthetic animal. Now let's explain each of these life forms. First, I'm going to start by creating a basic plant. From the water, I found a stable temperature area and putting in a basic plant. In the first section of the evolution, I'm going to focus on increasing the max energy by adding the vascular component, adding a couple of branches where each branch adds two max energy, and then adding a short stem. The short stem is key because it allows me to then add the new component short roots. This allows the plant to survive in low water areas on land. I let the plant reproduce naturally, and then I found a non-moisture spot where it stopped. There is no moisture, no vegetation, so here we need to help it a little bit. One of the key components of plant life is the stem. You can evolve the stem to change the maximum and minimum temperature, although in my case I actually just want to use a stem that has no requirement for soil moisture. So this plant will be able to survive in deserts. Now that we understand the basic of plants, I'm going to explain the more nuanced versions. So you have components like flowers that you can add to these plants. And flowers are great to add the reproduction and nutritional value, especially because these can be further evolved into fruits. Similarly, we can add leaves. Leaves are great to increase the max energy, then can be upgraded to different aesthetics of leaves but apart from the base leaves, if you upgrade the medium to a large stem, you can then add tree leaves. Be careful though, because it does increase the requirement for air humidity and soil moisture. So in an area like mine, it will immediately die. To better showcase how plants reproduce, I recreated another tree in a very similar way in an area with enough moisture and humidity. And you can start seeing it spread over the area the other type of plant, which is the fungi, can only be created to the cell state. So first, we're going to add the mitochondrion and a cell wall. As long as you add cells that keep it with the organism diet, it will eventually evolve into a fungi. The component structure of fungi is similar to that of plants. They have stalks where that influences the maximum and minimum temperature, as well as the aesthetic. You can similarly add caps that have some different values in reproduction, humidity, and so on. And you can also add the mycelium to make them survive in low water or even further into the land. The core feature of mushrooms is their symbiotic relationship with the world. 
first D starts with feeding of that matter, so that is quite straightforward. However, that can be upgraded into either mycorrhizal symbiosis where they help plants produce. This is very useful in areas where herbivores eat a lot of the plants because you want a high volume of plants. The other version is the parasitic mushroom. And if we look at a forward section where we have actual creatures, you will see that the creatures are being damaged by the parasitic fungi. Now that we've mentioned creatures, it's time to focus on the animal life. First, let's look at this creature that we had created from the cell stage and has a photosynthetic diet. This is exclusive to creatures from cell stage with light diet. Similar to plants, these animals do produce oxygen, however, there is a major weakness that their maximum energy is capped due to their digestive system being photosynthesis. Most times, you will start with basic animals that look like beads, and you can place artifacts that influence the reproduction and mutation rates, and within just a couple of seconds at 10 times speed, I can already see natural mutations like eyes. But if we want to evolve them manually, here are the key components to understand for animal life. First, the digestive system is crucial for the max energy. You have to add at least a basic mouth to unlock the further evolutions of that digestive system. And you can see it you first have the digestive tubes before becoming a fully fledged digestive system that increases 190 max energy and we can add a lot more components. Once we add them out, the diet changes from the microorganisms to actual food. So we have plants and meat for the basic mouth, and that can be specialized. So bees can be herbivores, or they can even get more nutritional value from fruit. Or you might choose a mouth that is more predatory, like jaw or mandible, which only consume meat. As soon as we evolve a carnivore, you can immediately see some fighting going on. And that leads us to talk about life, attack, and defense values. When adding predatory mounts like the mandible, you will see that they have a plus 2, for example, attack power. However, the key component here is size. By upgrading the size, you're increasing the life, attack and defense by a substantial value. An animal with an endo or exoskeleton can add more parts to its creature, such as the horn or even the sting, to make them a stronger attacker and even inflict poison. On the flip side, you may have creatures that primarily focus on the fangs. You can add components like spikes, bone spikes with the tail, or items like shells. But how do animals look for food? You may see that these creatures are moving very rapidly, because they're starving and they need food. The key component here is the speed in ground or in water, or even in air, depending on their body parts. For creatures with an exoskeleton, you can add components like the insect leg, which are useful for those on the ground, or even proto wings that can be evolved into scale wings, which can either look like butterflies or just insect flies. The endoskeleton creatures allow more flexibility because the frizz can be upgraded to a lot more types of legs, and you can also have the prototype wings, which can be further evolved into the bird like feather wings or the bat membrane wings. A common mistake though is thinking that legs means that your creatures will survive in land. As we can see, this creature is suffocating, and that is because it doesn't have a respiratory system. By adding gills, we are increasing the maximum energy, but we can then upgrade the gills into the tech like lungs. These are perfect for amphibians because they can survive on the land and they can survive in water. The respiration system can be further evolved into the lungs, which does increase the maximum energy, However, that means they cannot survive in water. Apart from that, we also have to make sure that they have a tough skin. But for example, this creature is freezing in this cold. What we're going to do is add the single layered skin, which allows me to go into both colder and warmer temperatures. For those with endoskeleton, this can be further evolved into feathers, scales or fur skin. And fur skin is perfect to go into very cold temperatures. So now we have upgraded our creature enough that it can survive the coldest areas within this planet. If you're facing any challenges, a key tip is to look at the tile history. You will have the history of the location which explains any challenges that there were. So a plant is dying because the temperature is too low or a creature is starving. Those are the components to understand what you need to do. Is it upgrade 
the stem or the skin for a different temperature, or perhaps evolve a respiratory system if your creature is suffocating. As you continue to watch your creatures evolve and mutate, you probably get attached to some specific creatures. Go to the encyclopedia and hit export. Then, within other planets, you can create life by import creation. In my case, because it is a predator, I had to make sure to add additional animals for it to feed off or otherwise it was going to starve. If you found this video helpful, make sure to subscribe and let me know in the comments what you'd like to know more about in this game. I thank you for watching, bye bye.